Medical Director of the California Maternal Quality Care Collaborative, and I'm pleased to have so many people joining us today. This is the second seminar in a series of introductory seminars to uh, a statewide initiative for supporting vaginal birth and reducing C-sections. Sort of interesting, I was uh, just on a, a national uh, uh, conference call regarding some of the quality improvement projects that are going on throughout the country, uh, of which uh, this is one. Uh, there are several other states that are undertaking this as well, but I will tell you, uh, talking around the country, uh, it is nice to be in California. Everyone else has temperatures below freezing, and I'm sitting here in, in San Francisco uh, Bay Area with a temperature of about 65 and sunny. So uh, we can all be blessed to live in California. Uh, what we will be doing today is talking about the statewide initiative, uh, the toolkit that's going to be released, uh, et cetera. And we have to, to do this call of uh, four, four of us from CMQCC that are, are leading the efforts in different areas, and I'll introduce them briefly and then more detail as they start. Uh, their, se their sessions, their portions of the uh, meeting today. Uh, they include Ann Castles, who's uh, been uh, the leader for the project on the Maternal Data Center and doing data, uh, helping us all do data-driven quality improvement. Nancy Peterson, who is one of the editors of the toolkit that's coming out, who's also led several of the other toolkits from uh, CMQCC. Uh, and Kim Workmeister, uh, who is a nationally known quality improvement leader, uh, including working uh, with some of the national HENs, the American Hospital Association HEN, which is huge. And in one of her areas of expertise has been in maternity quality improvement, and she's going to be helping lead uh, the statewide collaborative on this. Uh, so I'd like to go ahead uh, and start. Uh, so what we're going to cover today on our objectives, first, uh, why focus on C-sections? Uh, and so I will give some background uh, as to the pros and cons of C-sections and then look a bit at understanding the cesarean measures, which ones uh, have are being used now nationally by many of our quality uh, measurement partners like the Joint Commission uh, and LeapFrog, uh, as well as CMS. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to Ann to talk about the Maternal Data Center, uh, what it is, how it can be helpful, and how it's helped uh, us and other projects. Uh, uh, Nancy will go over the CMQC toolkit on supporting vaginal birth. Uh, and then we'll talk about the statewide collaborative, which will be kicking off uh, in April. Uh, what is CMQCC and, and who are our partners, just uh, as a preface here? We're really a statewide collaborative of a whole variety of organizations that is focused on reducing uh, complications uh, of pregnancy, including maternal death and maternal severe morbidity, and improving mother and baby outcomes. So this has engaged and involved in our executive committee many organizations, including state agencies listed here, uh, membership associations like the Hospital Association, the Pacific Business Group on Health, Integrated Healthcare Association, which does a lot of the measurements for medical groups, for example, uh, public and consumer groups, including Chart and March of Dimes, California Healthcare Foundation, uh, as well as our, our professional groups. Uh, uh, we are blessed in California to having our statewide chapters uh, uh, districts for the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the A1, the Nursing Association for Labor and Delivery and Nursery Staff, uh, Midwife's uh, Organization, the Family Practice Organization. We've also highly and actively engaged the uh, medical and nursing leaders from uh, the major systems uh, uh, listed here, as well as the uh, members of the public hospital system. Uh, when you look at CMQCC and what we've been up to over the last 10 years, it's really been a focus on reducing maternal mortality and morbidity. We, we with the state, have 
helped organize and helped lead the Maternal Mortality Review Committee for California, the first and only in our state's history. And that's given us the opportunity to identify uh, quality improvement issues uh, for maternity care that's in turn turned into toolkits for hemorrhage and preeclampsia and soon to be out venous thromboembolism prevention. Uh, we've also helped uh, identify and refine and improve a number of quality improvement measures that have been used in turn by the Joint Commission and others. Uh, and lastly, on the, on the left side, uh, we've been focused on how we can take some of these tools and measures and actually have them lead to improvement of care in a very large scale. California has 250 odd maternity hospitals uh, with over a half million births each year. Uh, so we've been working on different ways of reaching all those hospitals, reaching, uh, uh, touching all those uh, physicians and nurses and doing large scale quality improvement. All of these are really dependent on having uh, a robust maternal data center that can help guide us and help show improvement and show uh, where we still need to do work. Uh, the statewide, the way we have approached these issues in the past is to first start with statewide multidisciplinary task forces that develop toolkits and then, and then guides for how to put them into practice or implementation guides. Uh, these have included the very first one we did with the March of Dimes for elimination of early elective delivery, and then the hemorrhage one, which was uh, so successful we actually did a, uh, a second edition of it this, just this last year, uh, together with a preeclampsia toolkit. Uh, all these have been out. All these have been open source, high, uh, very frequently downloaded. We're up to over 5,000 downloads for these. Uh, and they're uh, strongly encouraged and have been very successful. But the model of having a multidisciplinary team from all over the state uh, coming together and, and identifying best practices that we can all share and a, a review of the literature uh, really has been a, a good model. Uh, turning to cesarean birth, uh, this has been a, a issue that's uh, been one for maternity care and obstetrics for many years. Uh, this is only since uh, about 1990 that we've seen this rise of about 50% from 21 to 32. Uh, even before the 1990s, it was actually in the teens or even lower. Uh, but it it's, uh, had this rise now up to 33%. And California's here not been a leader. It's been pretty much average for the country. Uh, and, but this rise has been uh, not only dramatic, but uh, evidence of a large amount of variation in care. Uh, and we're going to talk about variation because that really underscores a lot of the opportunities that we have. Uh, but this rise has occurred uh, without any parallel uh, documentation of any benefit for mother or the baby. So we've, we've increased it from 6% in the early 70s, which was clearly probably on the low side, to the 20s and the 80s, to 33% currently. But the rates of cerebral palsy and neonatal seizures have been unchanged since 1980. Uh, and there's been low, uh, when all said and done, we have not actually been able to show benefit for long-term urinary incontinence, which was one of the initial you know, reasons for considering uh, or a side benefit of C-section. That hasn't panned out either. Uh, at the same time, we've had increased maternal morbidity uh, and maternal mortality throughout the country. Uh, and when you drill it down, there are some of these that can be laid at the door of C-sections. And these include uh, more uh, baby admissions to the NICU for respiratory problems. Uh, it's a, almost a a 2x rate uh, in term and near term for elective C-section without uh, any labor. Uh, but there's also evidence about affecting uh, maternal infant bonding uh, and breastfeeding success. And everyone knows uh, the, the concern about postpartum infections, uh, blood clots, uh, transfusions rates, which are all more than doubled. 
Uh, and a doubling in the postpartum readmission rate. Now readmissions are a big thing for CMS and others. The biggest risk, however, is becoming a prior C-section. Uh, and this is not something that's typically discussed when, when I, as an obstetrician, discuss C-sections with women. Uh, until more recently, we haven't really discussed, okay, you know, we have the issues throughout this pregnancy, but what about your next and the one after that? And that's where actually the risk gets bigger. If you've had two or three C-sections, your risk of placenta previa or deeper invasion of, to be a, a placenta accreta really start to rise. And then these are associated with hysterectomy uh, or even more major complications uh, with uh, uh, blood clotting disorders. Uh, prior C-sections, of course, are also associated with uterine ruptures and they actually have a fairly high rate of abdominal adhesions, uh, which is uh, something that is not well discussed commonly. So variation. Uh, this is what's catching everybody's attention, is that, okay, uh, you know, if everyone had the same C-section rate, that would mean that, that uh, practice patterns were pretty uh, stable and pretty uh, accepted, that there was a certain way of doing it. But that's not the case. Uh, this was a review of every hospital in the United States looking at total C-section rate and seeing a tenfold variation around the country. Uh, you know, they narrowed it down a little bit to uh, 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 primary C-sections, still saw huge variation. Uh, so this raised a whole series of questions. So we wanted to look at that in California, and this is our most uh, a, a recent year, 2013, uh, and looking at the variation of the total C-section rate among all our hospitals here. Uh, and it ranges from 15 to 71 percent. So that's at least a five-fold variation among our hospitals. Uh, the median and mean rates are pretty similar to the national rates, right around 33 uh, percent. But total C-section rate is not really a, a number that's used by many uh, because it's, it includes all comers, including all the repeats uh, and all the complications, et cetera. And many people will say, as shown in the bottom right, our patients are higher risk than others, uh, than other hospitals, and so that doesn't really apply to us. So this is where the specific measure makes a difference. Uh, total C-section rate includes repeat and primary. There's no risk adjustment. It's not really used uh, for quality improvement uh, by any organization currently, but it is in the public domain in many, in many but gets in the newspapers, and that's an issue. The next one that's commonly cited is the primary C-section rate, which is here the denominator is every, every mom who does not have a prior C-section. So it's women having their first C-section. Uh, this, however, does include uh, multiples, uh, women having their second or third or fourth vaginal delivery, as well as women having their first. And uh, that's a, a big mix of risk factors. So it's easy to have a vaginal birth if it's your third or fourth, shall we say. It's much harder having your first. In addition, there's no, no exclusions for other populations at risk which is what led to the TSV C-section rate, which focuses on term, singleton, vertex moms, excluding twins, excluding breaches, and preemies. Uh, so ARC, which is one of the, uh, the uh, national folks who've done the first pass of C-section, or of all kinds of quality measures, picked this up about 15 years ago. Uh, and it is, been calculated, but it, it, the problem here is that it includes multips and nullips again. Uh, and nulliparity, as we spoke earlier, is a critical risk factor, and it does vary greatly from hospital to hospital. This led to the development of the NTSV C-section, which is the Joint Commission, PCO2. It's also endorsed by ACOG, leaf, and it's the leapfrog measure. Uh, it's on the CMS list, and it's used in Healthy Person 2020. So this is, just to frame it, it is all first birth moms at term, singleton pregnancy, head first. So it's not, 
doesn't exclude every high-risk case, but it focuses in on a standardized population. Uh, the rates are much higher than the primary C-section rate because it includes only nullips. Multips dilute a rate greatly if you, when you include them. Uh, there's been a series of studies that, uh, identifying uh, whether other risk adjustments need to occur, whether you need to adjust for age or BMI or, or uh, hypertension or diabetes. When all said and done on those, they, the plus or minus is at the most 1 or 2 percent. Uh, it does not account for the variation that you see in this. Lastly, that we won't really mention much is that the multi-term singleton vertex rate, uh, which is quite low. It's often in hospitals 4%, 5%, 6%, uh, occasionally 7%. So that's in contrast to a null up rate, which is 20, 30, or 40%. And indeed, uh, when you compare them statewide, you see the averages here, total C-sex rate of 32, the NTSV rate is 26 on average, and the multip rate is in the sixes. What this does not uh, uh, account for, however, is the, the average highs the, the great variation. Now, this is 2014 data for every hospital in California. Every hospital is shown as a bar here. Very thin bar, 251 hospitals. Uh, and you can see that the after this risk adjustment, you still have huge variation. Here it's 12 to 70 percent, if anything, a little higher. Uh, there is a national target for this one that ACOC had endorsed previously of 23.9. Uh, it's of interest that 40 percent of hospitals are already at that target. And these include urban hospitals, rural hospitals, university hospitals, the whole range. There are some, some of each in that 40%, and there's some of each of those in the above the 23.9. Uh, and one of the principles of quality improvement is whenever you see such large variation, that uh, gives you a strong hint that there's opportunity for improvement. So we, we've seen in the past that there's big variation in care, that there are hospitals that have low C-section rates and hospitals that have high C-section rates. We're actually, as part of the toolkit, have done interviews with some of those low hospital, uh, uh, low C-section rate hospitals to identify the practices uh, that are, are that can be shared and some of the secrets, if you would, or approaches that they've taken to have a low C-section rate. But we really wanted to be able to see that you could take a hospital that was on the high end and work with it in quality improvement projects and show that you could lower it, which is different than a hospital that has a long history of being low. Uh, and so this, so because here we're taking the same patients, same doctors, same nurses, and saying if we change how you approach the care on labor and delivery, can you change the C-section rate? So this is a hospital in Orange County that had a pretty high C-section rate in over three or four years. You see the baseline here is in years, 2011, 2012, 2013, and they range 31 to 33 percent year over year. Now that's in the, in the top quartile, not the highest. You saw some that were 50, uh, but this is uh, a pretty higher rate hospital. Uh, and we started this in January 2014. So, uh, about two years ago now, uh, we've been working with them, and uh, we gave them each doctor's C-section rate. Uh, we worked with their nursing staff uh, to, to set up a really a more supportive environment for uh, normal birth, uh, and we gave them data each and every month, uh, and some of the local employers and insurance companies uh, uh, got very interested in this as well. Uh, and there was sort of writing on the wall that there was going to be uh, more and more uh, blended payments involved in this, and so they embraced this. And actually, within one month of working on this all together, uh, we started to see an effect, and this effect continued on uh, over the first five months that we actually got them within a six-month period to be under the national target starting after they'd been stable in the 30s for several years. Uh, so this 
this is not an easy population. This is Newport Beach, uh, an older clientele, if you would, uh, of women who had pretty strong ideas, and it really cut through the point that it was women who wanted a C-section and there was nothing that could be done. So by doctors and worse, patients uh, and, and nurses all working together with their leadership, uh, this was quite impressive. Uh, we did this with two other hospitals in Southern California where the rates are a bit higher than they are in Northern California. Uh, and each of them achieved approximately a 20% reduction uh, and this has now been sustained for well over a year. Uh, hospital number three here had a little bit lower rate, but they actually lowered it to 21, uh, almost 20 or 22% here. So this really answered the question of whether you can take a high C-section hospital and turn it, uh, work with them and actually lower the C-section rate. So the big question is, of course, are there any downsides? Uh, and here, as we approach any quality measure, quality improvement project, we want to have balancing measures. Uh, first of all, if you have a lot more vaginal births, uh, maybe you know, squeaking out a kit, are there any increases in third or fourth degree uh, vaginal lacerations, perineal lacerations? And we were able to demonstrate in all three hospitals that their third and fourth degree laceration rate was unchanged from prior four-year baseline. Now, the most important outcome of a birth, though, is, of course, a healthy baby a much more important outcome than a C-section or third or fourth degree laceration, anything else. And what we've been using here is an NQF-endorsed measure, national measure, uh, of a neonatal composite of unexpected uh, newborn complication. And this asks whether a baby at term, so excluding preemies, without any pre-existing conditions, no birth defects, no injury, no injury uterine growth retardation, uh, no intrauterine complications of other kinds. Uh, had in, so this this good group of babies to begin with, when they came to the hospital for birth, whether they left with any uh, major complications, uh, uh, respiratory uh, infection uh, or birth injury. Uh, the, all of those uh, are, are, from the parent's viewpoint, a pretty major thing. So we looked at these and these three hospitals, followed them over time, uh, and there was absolutely no change in the hospital's rates, no, no worsening, certainly. One of the hospitals had significant improvement in unexpected newborn complications as their C-section rates went down. Uh, so that was reoccurring. Now, the next question is, the, do people care about C-section rate? And I think that's one of the reasons why the rate has drifted up so much is about 10 years ago, uh, it stopped being an agenda item, uh, stopped being a review item with perinatal committees, it stopped being something that was reported publicly. Uh, and uh, so we wanted to ask whether people were starting to care anymore. And actually, this is now an agenda item for our large employers, particularly those who are self-insured. Uh, we met with a number of big employers around the country, and they were uh, very concerned about these kind of rates. Uh, some of the big purchasers, which are CalPERS and Cover California, which is the ACA program, which has several million employ uh, enrollees in California alone, and Medi-Cal, which pays for half the births and their managed care programs. So those are now uh, the biggest purchasers. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, the major health plans, uh, the major health plans uh, that are, are engaged include uh, the Blues and HealthNet and Aetna uh, and our Medi-Cal fee-for-service program. Uh, public groups have been very strong in pushing this to be a public release measure. Uh, including CHART, the California Department of Insurance, and Consumers Union. Uh, now we have ACOG District 9 and A1 and ACNM also engaged in this project and working with us in, in hand. Uh, so last, uh, about 10 days ago, uh, the, the 
uh, NTSV C-section rates were released to every hospital leader from the hospital association. Uh, these are going to go live and be public release next week. Uh, so there's, we anticipate a fair amount of newspaper coverage of this. The LA Times is very engaged on this one. Uh, and this is uh, done through the California, through CHART, uh, which is uh, funded by the California Healthcare Foundation through Cal and be found on the web and calqualitycare.org. Uh, so this has generated a lot of interest among our administrators. Uh, and uh, this is how it's being, being laid out uh, on the mother and baby sections. Uh, you'll have uh, different hospital ratings, uh, poor, below average, superior, good, or above average, and superior. Uh, and so this is this is now public, uh, and will be uh, in uh, spread around the state next week. So your your hospital leadership already has your numbers and the numbers in your community. Uh, so what we're uh, offering today is really how to work uh, with all kinds of collaborative statewide, all kinds of partners statewide to support normal vaginal birth, which is really the focus here, which in turn would be reducing primary C-section. So assuming your hospital has a rate higher than 23.9 or has a lot of opportunities, you know, what are we, what can we offer? How can we work together? So before, uh, so what we anticipate the action steps to be is to first to understand what drives your cesarean birth rate using a set of rapid cycle uh, data with standard measures and QI tools that we've developed over the last two and a half years in the maternal data center, uh, which we're going to explain in detail in a moment. And then uh, the actual uh, steps to make change would be supported by the toolkit uh, which is a very exciting uh, multidisciplinary project, uh, which will be out in March. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, by working together in a QI collaborative on supporting vaginal births and, re and reducing C-sections. So I'm going to turn it over to Anne next uh, to uh, really work on describing and uh, giving you a better understanding of what the Maternal Data Center is. We have... 75% of all the births in the state are active members, uh, hospitals that deliver those. But Ann, go ahead and take it away. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm Ann Castles. I'm the program manager for the CMQCC Maternal Data Center. I know a lot of folks on the call today are probably active track participants in the Maternal Data Center, but for those of you who aren't, I want to just give you a very brief introduction to the Maternal Data Center, but please know that you can always contact me to request a more detailed informational demonstration for your hospital team or just to ask any questions at all. So what is the CMQCC Maternal Data Center? It is a secure online tool that helps your hospital monitor, monitor your perinatal rates in real time, enables you to make comparisons to other peer groups, so for example, other hospitals in your county, other hospitals in your perinatal region, hospitals across the state. You can assess provider variation within your hospital, of which there can be quite a bit sometimes. The tool also has a number of measure analysis components that helps you identify quality improvement opportunities um, for your hospital. And there are many, many other features as well. And I'm going to go through some of them today. Okay. Um, any California hospital can join. It remains completely free in 2016. We are just now starting to implement a membership model for 2017. We've been having some phone calls on that this week as well. But if you join now in 2016, it's still free, as it has been for the last two and a half years, thanks to very generous grant funding from the California Healthcare Foundation. Okay. 
Um, we um, actually launched back in 2012. As Elliot mentioned, we now um, have over 150 California hospitals that participate, representing 75% of California delivery volume just in the last year. Um, Kaiser Permanente, both North and South join, Dignity Health, Sutter Health, as well as St. Joseph Health. So if your hospital is, is one of those systems, then you are already actively submitting data to the Maternal Data Center. And then we also happen to have expanded in the last couple of years to Washington and Oregon. So we now have about 200 hospitals participating all along the Pacific Coast. Okay. Um, how exactly do we generate these perinatal metrics? Where is this data coming from? Well, it's all designed to be a process that minimizes your data collection burden. We know you're very busy people um, trying to deliver care and manage clinical operations. Our goal is to bring data to you so to minimize the time you're spending on abstracting data, getting data files in, and then enable you to have more time for the actual more important quality improvement work. How do we do this? By leveraging data sets that your hospital is already collecting and reporting to different state agencies. Specifically, that means the data center uses patient discharge data that your hospital already reports to a state agency called OSHPID. This is basically made up of the ICD-9, now ICD-10 codes that reflect the diagnosis and procedure codes for all cases. Your HIM departments are already collecting and coding these data, and it's already being submitted to a state agency. Hospitals that wish to participate in the maternal data center as active track participants then take these same reports that already exist in your hospital and upload them on a more frequent, timely basis directly into the maternal data center. So you could have data in the system through December 2015 right now. Okay. The other piece is we receive birth certificate data from the state. The original source of the birth certificate data is your hospital. It gets entered by your team of birth clerks, sent to the state, the state sends it to us, and then we populate it into your hospital account for you. So there's no extra work at all around the birth certificate data. We take these two large data sets, we automatically link them together, and completely automatically and instantaneously, we calculate dozens and dozens of different perinatal quality and management statistics to help guide your quality improvement activities. Um, again, I'm happy to do a more in-depth training to uh, even get more detailed about exactly how this works. Okay. But I want to start showing you the features of the tool. Okay. When you decide to become an active track participant in the Maternal Data Center, you register your hospital to have its own confidential account within the Maternal Data Center. So you would log in, you'd be able to authorize access to those other folks at your hospital that you want to be able to access this, and you would have hands-on access to all of the perinatal metrics that are available in the Maternal Data Center. This is a sample of the home page and what it looks like. As you can see, we generate metrics ranging from hospital clinical performance measures, provider performance measures, data quality measures, so that you can take a look at your coding practices and see if there might be potential areas to improve coding that can in turn improve your performance on several of these perinatal metrics. If you're part of one of our collaboratives, then we also have special sections to help you um, track your progress in those collaboratives. And then we have a whole bunch of different hospital statistics just so that you can learn more about um, the characteristics of your delivering population. What are your maternal age distributions? What percentage of your patients have diabetes um, or PROM? What's your length of stay and how does it compare to the other hospitals in your perinatal region? Lots and lots of different metrics for you. Okay. This is just a sample of the 32 hospital clinical quality measures 
that can be calculated in the maternal data center. I, I'm sorry it's a little fuzzy. This is actually even a subset of the 32 hospital clinical performance measures. But what I'd like to do today is show you the functionality of the tool in terms of one measure, the nulliparous term singleton vertex C-section rate, um, and then, um, but know that the same functionality exists for any one of these measures in the maternal data center. And we're just using NTSV C-section rate as one example. Okay, feature number one. Okay, automated screens that show your trends over time for that particular measure. So for your hospital, you'll automatically see your performance over time going back all the way to 2011 because we have data going back to 2011 for all California hospitals then through whatever time that you've submitted the more recent data through. You can choose to view these reports with a click of a button on a monthly, a quarterly, or an annual basis, and you can really easily download the graphics into an image file so that you can um, insert it into a PowerPoint for an OB committee meeting, okay? Or you can also really easily, with a click of a button, download the numerical data. That's the trend line section. But what's really powerful about the tool is the ability to drill down to the patient level. Again, with a click of a button, you can drill down and see a screen where each row represents a different case that was a fallout for that particular measure. That is a case that, for this particular measure, had a cesarean amongst those women that were nulliparous term singleton vertex. You'll see the medical record number for that case, so if you want to, you could do a lookup in your internal systems, you'll see the delivery date, and you'll see all the diagnosis codes, including the ability to, as you hover over the diagnosis codes, see the exact definition of each and every diagnosis or procedure code. Um, so you do not necessarily have to have your ICD-10 coding manual handy. Birth weight, gestational age, whether the case had been induced or not. And then the provider ID. This is the ID of the delivering provider. We're getting this from the birth certificate data. So you can actually see which provider delivered the case, and then we map it to the database maintained by the California Medical Board. So when you log in, you can actually display this by provider name. Okay. This is the drill down screen. Okay. Other feature, you can then click on peer comparisons to see how your hospital's performance compares to all the other hospitals that are in your county, all the other hospitals that are in your larger perinatal regions, and all the other hospitals across the state. And you can customize these statistics for whichever time period you prefer. You just choose your own start date, the duration, one month, two months, three months, six months, eight months, 12 months, okay? And then whether you wanna use active track data or statewide data. Lots and lots of flexibility within the tool. If you are part of a system, then you can also see the rates for all of your sister institutions within that system. Again, with just another click of a button. Um, and so, for example, the Sutter Health, the Dignity Health can see by name all of the hospitals um, that are in their system for comparison purposes. We can also generate provider level metrics. Again, just with a click of a button, you can go. We auto calculate 10 different clinical quality measures at the provider level, including C section rates, episiotomy rates, laceration rates, early elective delivery rates. So you'll be able to see the full list of your providers and what their rates are, how they can compare to each other, as well as how they compare to the hospital average and the statewide average. We see tremendous variation across providers, even within the same institution. These are actually real data from a California hospital. And note that the two busiest providers, okay, in terms of their delivery volume, okay, 
actually have widely differing C-section rates, um, with one being about half the C-section rate of the other. This is not uncommon to see within an institution tremendous variation. Another component of the tool, a feature that we call the measure analysis tool, and this is where we can take your overall primary C-section rate and then break it down into subcomponents so you can identify how you can target your efforts. All too often you see, you know what, I've got a high C-section rate, I'm not quite sure what to do about it. And of course, some of the things you can do about it will be um, describing in great detail in the toolkit, but in terms of figuring out where to prioritize your effort at your hospital, because different institutions, practices differ, okay, we have this measure analysis tool where we break down your primary C-section rate into those women that are in the term singleton vertex, represented by the blue, women that were multi-term singleton vertex, represented by the red, and those that were preterm multiples and breach, as represented by the green. And then we show your rates for each of these subpopulation for your hospital as compared to all other hospitals that have your same nursery level, whether you have a basic nursery, an intermediate, a community, or a regional nursery, so you're comparing to a comp comparable set of other hospitals, and then you can compare your rate for that subpopulation for all hospitals across California. This is a really great way to identify where you can focus your effort, which subpopulation you want to tackle first. This is just the first step in the measure analysis, is identifying one subpopulation. But then we take it a step further, and then let's say we want to look at that nulliparous term singleton vertex population. We break it down even further, and for those that are in TSV, we look at those that started off in spontaneous labor, as displayed in the blue, versus cases that were induced as displayed in the red versus cases that went right to C-section. And again, you can compare your hospital's performance for that particular subcategory compared to other hospitals with your nursery level and other hospitals statewide. Okay. All ways to help you focus your activities. Okay. Another feature, okay. Um, is around the labor management guidelines that were, um, that were published by ACOG and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine a couple of years ago. Um, most of you are probably well aware of this, but um, in, this, um, in this publication, they defined labor management guidelines to help um, with safely reducing primary cesarean births. Okay. In the maternal data center, We've taken those guidelines and we allow you to see to what extent you actually meet the guidelines. Um, so if after reviewing your data, then you can see for each of these categories, okay, whether your providers um, met guidelines as displayed in the green versus not meeting guidelines as displayed in the red. And then you could actually click on the red numbers, okay, under the guidelines not met, and if you were to click on those numbers, you'd be able to drill down to the patient level and see exactly which cases for which guidelines were not achieved. Again, all tools to help you understand your practices. One additional tool I'll briefly talk about today, um, we are rolling out control charts in the maternal data center. So for those of you who really like to track your progress and, and use that to motivate your providers, these control charts let you define when you might have begun a very specific QI intervention. You can see how your rate starts to drop. And then once you feel like you've stabilized that rate, you could indicate that. And you can tell from a statistical standpoint if, you, if that intervention has, in fact, had a statistically significant difference, um, all, again, with several clicks of the button. Okay. So for those of you on the call that 
aren't already members of the Maternal Data Center, it's really pretty simple, okay? Step A, um, we do have a participation agreement um, that includes a business associate agreement. So you, the very first step would be to complete that participation agreement. Anyone who's interested in joining, um, just please reach out to me. You'll see my email address on the um, final slide of this presentation. It's acastles at cmqcc.org, and I would be happy to send you that participation agreement, okay? Next step is to submit patient discharge data, okay? Again, this is data that your hospital is already collecting and a file that is already being generated for reporting to that state agency called OSHBID, okay? Hospitals that choose to become active track participants in the maternal data center will, instead of waiting for that data to go to OSHBID, Okay, we'll submit that data directly to the maternal data center on either a monthly or quarterly basis, usually 45 days after the end of each month. Yeah. I am happy to talk to your HIM or IT departments um, to answer any questions they have about how this data submission works, and we do have a very detailed set of data specifications that, again, we can share on, on request, okay? okay. Lastly, once your data's in, then we gather for a training session um, with CMQCC staff where we review your data, show you how to navigate around the system, and basically get you prepped to use the tool for your quality improvement and to advance your quality agenda. Um, we're also always here. We have quarterly user group meetings, and we have a help desk um, that is always available to answer any questions that you have either on the technical component as well as how do I use these data component. Um, so this was a very rapid cycle introduction to the Maternal Data Center. Again, for hospitals whose interest is peaked, I'm happy to provide a one hour informational webinar for your hospital team. Um, and please just contact me and we will schedule a time that works for you all. Okay, with that, I am going to hand over the controls to Nancy Peterson to talk about the toolkit. Thank you very much, Ann. Can you all hear me okay? Hello? Can you all hear me? Yes, Nancy, I can hear you. Thank you. Sorry, I can hear you. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, and I'm very thrilled to be here to share with you a little preview on our toolkit to support vaginal birth and reduce primary cesareans. Um, as Elliot mentioned, I'm Nancy Peterson, and I am um, the Director of Perinatal Outreach at Stanford, as well as the Clinical Program Manager of CMQCC, and one of the co-chairs um, of this toolkit. Along with Holly Smith, who's a nurse midwife and a mas has a master's in public health, and has, I have to give a shout out to her because she has been incredible in keeping us on track with the toolkit process and just heard from her this morning that the toolkit has gone now to our graphic designer to put it into its beautiful format. So we're very excited about this project. And then finally, David LeGru is one of the other co-chairs and he is the Chief Integration and Accountability Officer at Memorial Care Health System in Orange County. And he was also um, the chair of the National Safety Bundle for Safe Reduction of Cesarean. So we've been very fortunate to have him guide us along on this process as well. Although I can't do two, so I can't do this. So what is the You were in it, so I was like, oh, I'll go after she's in it. We're getting some feedback from somebody that I, I just got out of it. Okay, no. I'll, I'll take it out. Okay. Um, so what is the toolkit? It's a comprehensive, evidence-based, how-to guide, essentially, to reduce primary cesarean delivery in the NTSC population. It will be the keystone of the QI implementation efforts, and it's really kind of a how-to guide to get us to improving our um, outcomes. I really want to point out that although the focus of this toolkit is on the NTSC rate, um, or first birth cesareans, the principles are generalizable to all women giving birth. So who was a part of this toolkit? 
Well, it was really a collaborative effort by a huge, diverse, multidisciplinary task force of over 50 expert writers and advisors, including obstetricians, anesthesiologists, midwives, nurses, as well as childbirth educators, doulas, and then public health experts and policymakers, healthcare purchasers, risk management and healthcare safety experts, as well as hospital administrators. So it was really a very diverse group that gave us a lot of help in making sure that our perspectives were all accounted for and, and part of this toolkit. Um, the experts, we were so fortunate really to have this large, broad group, um, a, a variety of organizations who enthusiastically joined us in this effort to really and had a commitment to um, uh, and common goal of reducing the rate of cesarean birth uh, in the NTSB population. So you can see it, it includes ACOG, the ACNM, the A1, um, California Hospital Association and HQI Institute. Childbirth Connection has been just extremely generous in providing us with all of their research and, um, and tools that are part of the toolkit. Blue Shield, Beta Healthcare Group, and then a lot of organiza healthcare organizations, Kaiser Permanente, Sutter Health, Memorial Care, um, many uh, university health systems, and also a lot of the birth centers that are out there to make, you know, that have been just uh, enthusiastically participating as well as urban and rural hospitals, which have very different needs sometimes. Um, and then our doulas of North America, Lamaz, and the Coalition for Improving uh, Maternity Services. So again, very fortunate that we had everyone's input and perspective. So the AIM bundle, um, Maternal Safety Bundle, um, is on safe reduction of primary cesarean births, um, is, is really how we aligned our toolkit to. And the AIM bundle, again, is part of the program for um, the Council on, on Patient Safety and Women's Health, which is a broad multi-stakeholder collaboration between lots of organizations, many of which were listed on the la um, previous slide, um, but includes ACOG, ACNM, and A1, and the American Academy of Family Practitioners, as well as others. Um, but it really is a roadmap to um, a small set of evidence-based practices that when organizations implement um, those practices can really improve their patient outcomes. And it revolves around the four domains of readiness, which is developing a maternity culture that values, promotes, and supports intended vaginal birth, recognition and prevention, which is generally labor support, and then response to every labor challenge, which is generally the management of, of labor abnormalities, and then finally reporting or using data to drive improvement. But we also included a section on those lessons learned from the three hospitals um, that Elliot um, spoke of earlier that were able to quickly and safely reduce their cesarean rates with a data-driven approach and using tools of the toolkit. Um, so we really um, interviewed these hospitals and included a lot of the strategies that you, they utilized to get their rates down. Um, and we also interviewed some hospitals who've been able to sustain low NTSB cesarean rates year after year to share with you some of their strategies. So what I'd like to do is kind of go through uh, the contents of the toolkit in a very brief format to kind of give you kind of a preview of, of what you um, might see in there. The first section is the readiness section which is creating a maternity culture that values vaginal birth. And as you know, changing the culture of maternity care is not an easy uh, task, but it really involves how you think about cesareans and how you talk about cesareans and really whether or not there are um, other incentives that are um, to do a cesarean versus being patient and waiting for a vaginal birth. And a lot of those strategies and tools focus on shared decision-making models and improving the access and relevance of childbirth education, bridging the provider and knowledge and skills gap, 
improving hospital leadership and harnessing the power of clinical champions. And then finally, payment reform and transitioning from paying for volume to paying for value. So some of the tools in this section are really, um, we have a indexes of best pregnancy resources to guide childbirth education and content. And where we have a lot of these resources, we've provided links directly to um, uh, via the web uh, to those sources um, so that you can easily access them. There's also tools, policies, and concepts to promote mother-friendly hospitals. There's also approaches for incorporating shared decision-making into patient care and engaging patients in a way that truly values their concerns and helps um, them make better informed decisions. And then there's various guides for creating alternative payment methods for maternity care with examples of what really has worked in the real world. The second section focuses on recognition and prevention, and general, general labor support. And these strategies and tools really focus on safely reducing routine um, obstetrical interventions in low-risk patients. Um, there's an implement, implementing early labor supportive care policies um, and active labor admission criteria. We've included improving supportive care and comfort during labor and improving supportive care infrastructure on the unit, um, as well as working collaboratively with doulas to effectively provide labor support. Inter implementing intermittent monitoring policies for low risk patients and then best practice recommendations for OB anesthesia. So again, some of the examples of some of the tools in this section are um, there are a lot of model policies that you can take and adapt to your own institution that include intermittent monitoring, freedom of movement, early labor support. There's nursing support of latent and early labor as well as um, tools to improve nursing knowledge and skill around supportive techniques and active labor. There's labor support guides, cheat sheets, and slide decks for teaching labor support to nurses. There's also the coping with labor algorithm for assessment of pain and coping in labor. We have guidelines for effectively working with doulas, as well as patient education and decision aids to assist facilities in coming up with a standardized patient educational tool for making decisions during labor. The next section focuses on response um, to every labor challenge and mainly management of labor abnormalities. In this section, there's a wide variety of strategies and tools that focus on implementing standard criteria and responses to labor and fetal heart rate abnormalities, such as safe use of oxytocin, standardizing the selection of patients for um, induction of labor, response to category two tracing, and diagnosis of dystocia. There's also a section, as we have in almost every toolkit that we've done, on creating high reliable teams and really improving interdisciplinary communication and situational awareness. And as you know, you know that requires a culture that values safety, collegial relationships, um, respectful communication, so that when labor abnormalities do arise, the team can quickly and efficiently um, provide the best course of action and the best outcome. Um, so this is a key focus of the toolkit. And then identifying malposition and implementing appropriate interventions to prevent the need for cesarean, using alternative coverage programs, laborist models versus collaborative practice models with uh, nurse midwives, um, and then the issue of liability-driven decision-making um, and the need to focus on quality and safety is also included with some strategies in the toolkit. So these are some of the um, tools um, related to this section. And again, there's just a few. There's a lot more. We have really tried to make this toolkit a menu of tools that you can take, um, and each hospital is going to be different as far as you know, what QI focuses they want to utilize. But um, this section will include spontaneous labor algorithms, dissocia checklists, induction of labor algorithms and checklists, policies for proper selection and scheduling of patients, 
algorithms for the management of abnormal fetal heart rate tracings, in particular um, category two management, um, model policies for safe use of oxytocin, the pre-oxytocin and in-use checklist, and then tools and guides for effective communication, teamwork, and situational awareness. And then finally, the last section is on reporting and using data to drive improvement. Um, and these tools and strategies focus on really creating an awareness of the scope of the problem by both the public providers and nurses, promoting transparency of hospital letter level data, and improving the data quality um, by creating actionable data and always keeping in mind to keep the data burden um, as minimal as possible, knowing that that's a, a huge barrier in many institutions, and then designing process measures to drive QI. So we recognize in putting this toolkit together that no two hospitals are the same, and every hospital, um, their QI focus is going to be different. Um, so, you know, they have to tailor some of the tools in here for their own organizations to um, make it work. Um, we will also have in the toolkit an implementation guide that will help organizations kind of identify the areas that they need to really focus on, which policies they might need, um, procedures and resources that are going to be most helpful. And I'm going to turn it over to Kim now so that she can talk a little bit more about supporting a vaginal birth collaborative that will be coming up. So thank you all very much. And I did want to let you know too, as Elliot mentioned, right now we're on track. Um, hopefully the toolkit will be done and ready for dissemination, hopefully by the end of March. But we will keep you all posted on our website so that you can um, be the first one there to, to download it. So thank you all very much. Great, thank you so much, Nancy. I am just thrilled with the number of hospitals that we have joining us today to learn about the scope of the problem, how the Maternal Data Center can help us to use real-time data analytics to drive improvement, and how the soon-to-be-released toolkit will help hospitals learn about expert recommendations to improve care. So, the next step, in driving NTSV um, cesarean rates downward is an active involvement in the QI Collaborative that we will be kicking off in just a couple of months, less than two months. Uh, we want to work with your organization to help drive improvement in this area further and faster. And for some reason, I am not able to, there we go. Um, the, so just a little bit about what the collaborative is. Um, the, our, the, our QI collaborative is bringing together leaders from California ACOG, A1, ACNM, stakeholders from across the state who are all going to be working together with our birthing hospitals to improve the NTSV cesarean delivery rates through the use of the Supporting Vaginal Birth and Reducing Primary Cesareans Toolkit recommendations. I apologize, I'm having a little bit of a delay in um, the pages going. So together we will be working towards a consistent effort to implement those bundle elements that Nancy talked about, the readiness, recognition and prevention, response to every labor challenge, and reporting. So there are a lot of reasons why your hospital should be involved in the collaborative in addition to downloading the toolkit. First and foremost, with the release of current data and newly released strategies for improvement that are coming out, reducing NTSV cesarean deliveries is a national patient safety focus now for patients, for providers, for accreditation agencies, and payer groups. You saw from, from Elliot, from Dr. Main, that 60% um, of California birthing hospitals are not meeting the goal yet, so there's a good chance that your hospital is in that group. And with all of this focus on here, your hospital's participation in the, the QI Collaborative shows your commitment to working to reduce pregnancy-related morbidity associated with cesarean delivery. I, I have been fortunate over the past decade to lead or co-lead dozens of patient safety collaboratives on a variety of different topic areas. And I can tell you that there are some things about this particular collaborative that are very different from any that I've ever been involved with before. First is that oh, the use of all of the features of the maternal data center that Ann walked us through. So we can, we have access to real-time data analytics. 
The other piece that I think is really key for our, our hospitals here is mentor support from experts for implementation of bundle elements in much smaller groups other than just the large group setting of the collaborative. As well, we will also be having access to national and local experts through grand rounds. We will come to you in-person and virtual education through webinars and in-person um, learning sessions and monthly mentor and small group team one-hour calls. So a little bit about what this mentor model looks like for us. Those of you that are on the line that are currently participating in the CPMS program are, are, are doing this too. And you know what I'm talking about when I say how different this is. You know, so often when we're in a large group collaborative, not every voice gets to be heard. And you may hear from, from uh, the loudest hospitals, but you might not be able to get your point across. We want to take that, that problem out, take that challenge out, and, and fix it. So what we do is we take out of the larger, say, 30 or so hospitals in each round of the, of the collaborative, we break them down into smaller groups of five to six hospitals who are, the, that group are assigned to a specific mentor physician and mentor nurse who are not only clinical experts in this topic area, but they're also quality improvement experts. And they are there specifically for your small group. How this works is we will have monthly web-based one-hour meetings with the small mentor group. The, the meetings are facilitated by the mentors. Every team will have an opportunity to report out on the challenges, barriers, successes that they are having. So we can get to, everyone gets an opportunity to share in those learnings. But additionally, those calls are all going to be supported by the CMQCC staff, either myself or the co-lead for this collaborative, Julie Vasher. And what that does is it gives us the benefit of perspective. So that we say a hospital is in their report out, is telling us about a specific challenge that they're having. We have the opportunity to be able to say, oh, you know what? On a call last week with another small mentor group, we heard about a hospital that had had this challenge and this is what they, they put in place and this is how they were able to be successful. Additionally, we're gonna be taking all of those learnings that we're hearing from all of the smaller group sessions and using that to plan our, our structured in-person and webinar-based learning sessions. So no one is going to be missing out on the larger group learning, but you get an opportunity to really get more in depth with your own set of local leaders. There's no cost to join our collaborative. We've been funded by a grant from the California Healthcare Foundation. That being said, there are some intangibles that your hospital will be needing to, to provide. Um, there are some internal resources, such as identifying a clinician and nursing champions, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And of course, putting aside some time for your hospital's perinatal quality improvement team to work on the implementation of the bundle elements, to do local education, and to be using the maternal data center to do some local data analytics and, and make decisions about what it is that you're going to be doing. Your hospital's involvement in the collaborative means that you are willing to be signing up to share and collaborate with others through participation in monthly one-hour mentor web-based team calls. We are planning for two regional in-person meetings as well as at least quarterly one-hour webinars that are education sessions for the entire group. It also means a commitment to de-identified data sharing of measures that are already being collected by, the, by your hospital through the active track status in the maternal data center. And as Ann showed you, most of that is already automated data collection reporting. Now we know when we're working on a new, um, a, a new process that we're trying to implement, there are going to be some process measures too that are not part of that automated data collection. But the, if we're not collecting a few process measures, we will have no idea whether or not the changes that we are making are resulting in an improvement. So we do need that, but that's short-lived and those are that, that data burden is very, very small. And we'll be working with you to, to ensure that you're collecting the appropriate process measures to get the, the uh, most effect from your outside data collection. 
some timelines for us. Now, each hospital can expect to spend one year implementing changes and making improvements during their participation in the collaborative. We are planning to do this over um, two, in two rounds that are going to be starting very shortly after, so there'll be a lot of overlap in the time frame. The first group of collaborative hospitals will begin with a group mostly in Southern California in May of 2016. And then the next statewide group will expand it much further, will begin just a few short months later. Now that being said, that doesn't mean that every single hospital in the first group will only be from Southern California. There may be others from other regions of the state, but that's, that's our plan, that's where the, the focus will be just to start. Still, <laughs> I know that you can still download a toolkit, so why does your hospital need to do anything other than just download the toolkit and follow along? That's a very good question. What I can tell you is that peer-to-peer -peer learning through a collaborative is the, and the networking, the sharing of best practices that comes from it are the best way to improve further and faster. We, what we say about collaboratives is what it does for you is it gives hospitals the ability to translate the knowledge that that, and that's the knowledge that you would get from the toolkit in this instance, the recommendations there. So we have the knowledge that we should be doing something into the knowledge how. How can I practically take those recommendations and implement them in my organization? In collaborative learning, we call that the how-to, how-to, really, of this. It also gives you the ability to rapidly spread innovations that we know work, and we know that it works because your peers have just done it. Your peers who have the same challenges that you do are, having the, are, are being able to be successful with it. it. It also gives us the ability to integrate reliability and sustainability into our improvement work. We're not just grasping at straws here. We know, we, we know that what we're putting in place does work because we're learning from our peers who have done it too. So we really do want you to join with us in this and to, to take those next steps in the commitment to improving NTSV cesarean rates. And before you do that, we would like for you to be able to, you know, think about it within your organizations before you, you send in an application for this. There are a few first steps that we would like for you to do. First and foremost, gather your perinatal quality improvement team together. No man can be an island in this work in a, in an, a hospital, so we, it does take a team. So that team and who you, you will need to identify before applying for the collaborative is to identify a physician champion, nursing champions, someone from your hospital's leadership administrative team. That person, you know, we know they're not going to be attending all of the meetings, but it's important that there is some leadership support for this effort and folks who understand what the goal is in it. And then as well, you'll want to name some folks from under quality risk management who can assist at the local level with implementation strategies and data analytics. Now, just a word about choosing a physician champion for this. Your physician champion does not have to be someone with a title after their name. It does not have to be the chair of the department. It doesn't have to be a medical director. Matter of fact, those people are probably too busy to be doing this, right? We want someone, a, a, a good, effective physician champion. And if you have a, a, a um, nurse midwife model in your organization, we also want a nurse midwife champion too. So this will apply to both, is someone who is currently clinically competent, they're respected by their peers, they're interested in this work. If they're passionate about this work, even better. <laughs> um, they have the ability to effectively communicate the efforts that, that the team is taking with their peers. The same goes for, for the nursing champion. While we need the support of nursing leadership, managers and directors to ensure that this is, that everyone's on board with what we are doing, your, your nursing champion does not have to be the director or the manager or even a charge nurse. If you have a frontline staff member who's passionate about this work and really wants to be involved, let that person be your, your um, nursing champion because that's one of the benefits also of participating in a quality improvement collaborative. We are building up quality improvement leaders across our organization and not just limiting that leader, those leadership skills to those who have the titles. 
The second step, once you've submitted an application, is to complete a readiness assessment that we will send you. And this is a quality improvement readiness assessment. So this, this is a way for your organization to perform a very short, simple, easy gap analysis about your readiness to get involved in um, collaborative improvement work. Some of you may be very far along in this and do this all the time and, and will have no issues with it. And some haven't done it very often, and that's okay, but we just wanna know where you are so we can plan accordingly. So if you're ready to take action and to join our collaborative with us, and we hope that you will, we will want you to um, sign up your team by sending in an application. Now, like I mentioned, there is going to be some prioritization in, for the first round for some Southern California hospitals, but that doesn't mean that those are the only hospitals that will be in that first round. Um, the second round will obviously be a little bit bigger, but what, as soon as that hospital commitment application is available on our website, should be in about a week or so, we will let you know. Please be checking our website, but we'll let you know. We want you to fill that out. Um, we will also have an extensive list of FAQs because I know I most certainly didn't cover anywhere close to the questions that would be coming up about the, um, participation in the collaborative. So we will have all of those so you can not only answer questions for yourself, but, but be able to answer and speak to this um, to your hospital leadership too. But any other questions that you may have, please don't hesitate to contact me, Kim Workmeister, or Julie Vasher, the co-lead for this project. Our, our um, contact information is right here. And we are really, really looking forward to hearing from you. So with that, I am going to um, pass the ball over to Dr. Main, who is going to close us out with a few closing thoughts and give us an opportunity for some question and answers. So Dr. Main, I will send it to you. Thank you very much, Kim. How this is really just to summarize all the things that we're gonna be bringing to bear for this project and how we can support you. Uh, while you think of the questions that you want to ask in our remaining uh, 10, 12 minutes, uh, we're trying to triangulate this as we do most of our quality improvement projects with data evaluate, data monitoring and evaluation, evidence-based support tools, and then in engagement of hospital clinicians, administrators uh, through a collaborative. And I think that's the way to, to really uh, approach quality improvement in the most effective way. Uh, we here are the contacts and, and resources. I'm going to leave this slide up. Uh, you can reach all of us through CMQCC, uh, and there's uh, more information on each of these areas. But I'm, I'm happy, uh, and I'm sure any of us will be happy to take any questions right now. Uh, and it's been a privilege to be able to present to uh, so many folks. You know, we've had there's 150 people on the line, so that's great. So, uh, questions uh, that folks have. So, Dr. Main, there's um, a couple of questions right now. The first one, uh, there's one here first. What do you think would be the value of participation of facilities that already have high vaginal del um, delivery rates, if any? Now, I can answer a piece of that, and I, I want your, your response too, but you know, we, we are going to be prioritizing first into the collaborative those that have higher uh, NTSC cesarean rates. Yes. I mean, that we want to make sure that we are, are making an impact across the state to lowering rates, but um, Dr. May, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I think you know, it would be great for you all to look over the toolkit and, and get some of the tips uh, from other hospitals. You may be able to add some tips if you're uh, particularly low. The, there are a number of hospitals that are kind of in the middle, you know, 23, 24, 25. You know, we're most interested in the hospitals that are 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. Uh, but I think there's opportunities to learn. For example, I showed one hospital that was at, one of our pilot hospitals was uh, at the 20, 25, 26 range. And they, they felt very comfortable bringing it down to 21. And we have hospitals in the state that are doing well with good babies that are at 18 to 20. So the national target is 
Uh, we think we're, you know, if hospitals lower their C-section rate, they'll end up uh, probably a fair amount lower than that. Uh, we have a number in the Bay Area with, with, you know, populations you might not think would be uh, so easy, like uh, a, a, with a lot of much older moms, uh, a lot of other complications of pregnancy that still can do quite well uh, with their primary C-section rate. So uh, I, I would encourage you to download the toolkit, and we may work out a, a light type of collaborative where, where people can get together and share, share ideas that's not as intense as a full collaborative where, where that's monthly meetings. So stay tuned on that one. Uh, lots of people are going to be looking at these numbers, and I think there's actually work to do to keep it low. I, it's, as I often say, uh, quality improvement is constant gardening. Okay, other questions? Uh, looks like there is a question about uh, the fees that were mentioned earlier starting in 2017. Uh, the Maternal Data Center has been grant supported by California Healthcare Foundation for the last several years, uh, and there is a move to make this sustainable uh, and also obtain uh, accessible to everyone in the state. So we've done a series of phone interviews uh, with 30 odd sites. Uh, and have come up with a fee schedule that would include all the materials that we generate, participation in the collaboratives, as well as the data center, that is in the range of about five, five to eight thousand dollars a year, uh, which is pretty small when you count count on how many how many dollars per birth that is for most hospitals. Uh, we are looking to get some uh, grant support for equivalent of scholarships for hospitals that have uh, that are very tiny or indoor have very high rates of medical I can't promise that right now but we're looking that that would end up costing you about two to three thousand dollars a year I think it's important that you have a commitment of your administrators to to play now at the same time uh, CalPERS California Hospital Association uh, Cover California are all going to be strongly promoting participation in the data center as we go forward, and are going to be highlighting this in their in their membership uh, materials and so forth. Because this, as we have done very well uh, with the data center, and reduce maternal morbidity and mortality, uh, and, and keeping keeping hospitals on track to where they are. And all the benchmarking tools are something you just can't do elsewhere. Um, this is Ann Castles. Let me also add for those that are asking about the fees. So if you go to cmqcc.org, the exact fee um, structure is um, in documents that are already on cmqcc.org. Just go to cmqcc.org, and um, there are sort of our headline news item right in the center of the home page. does say learn more about our membership fees. Once you click on that, you will be able to see the exact fee structure, and there will be um, discounts for um, multi-hospital systems if all the um, all the hospitals in the system um, choose to continue participation. I see. Um, there's a wonderful some comments of folks who are definitely going to be joining and don't, do not hesitate to contact me and I will um, happily answer some questions. I know there was also a question about where the information about the, the hospital um, application would be and it's not on our website yet. It will be shortly and we um, will send out an email to all the participants from the webinar to let them know once that's available too. But if you don't get the, the email, please be checking our website in the next seven to ten days. It looks like there's also a question around the um, what are the numerator and denominator for NTSV. Sure. The denominator are um, those deliveries that are nulliparous um, based on parity from the birth certificate data or the number of prior live births term. So those that are over 37 completed weeks gestational age, singletons, and in a vertex position per ICD-9 or ICD-10 coding. 
Um, so that makes up the denominator population. The numerator population are among the denominator cases who had a cesarean procedure. This is the exact same measure that is used by the Joint Commission, by LeapFrog, uh, and by others so in, in CMS and elsewhere. Uh, it has been around now for 15 years, so we have truly have a lot of data on it. Uh, nationally, we do get state rates on it uh, from the National Center of Health Statistics. Uh, and we, we have a lot of experience knowing the ins and outs of it. Uh, um, uh, other questions? You know, the NTSV really serves to focus you in on how you manage labor, because it takes a lot of the non-labor cases out, all the frequent causes of non-labor C-sections. And it focuses you on the management of nullips, the first verse, where, where most all the labor management issues are. Uh, and, and therefore, it's really uh, the, the helpful approach. The, the goal of this is to prevent that first C-section so we don't have to deal with VBACs or, or repeat C-sections. Uh, and that really is it's a key thing because the, the VBAC rate is only about 8 to 10 percent in California, which means that if you have a C-section in your first birth, 90 percent of all your future births will be by C-section. So it's really an important, uh, an important opportunity here we have with first-time moms. Okay. Any other things? I'm... I, I don't see the only other questions were about where this presentation will be posted on the website. It looks like Ann already answered that it's, and is that correct that it's already up? Or we're still waiting for this? So the, the, the issues around membership uh, right. okay, is, the... is up, I believe. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. On the Maternal Data Center web, um, website, this presentation is already posted. So go to the support section in the top black bar, and then under user groups, we're just, we're going to count this as a user group, um, then you will find the slide set. It's actually listed, we, this is a repeat, so we initially had this presentation on January 27th, so it is listed as 127.16 CMQCC webinar. Okay. Well, it is the end of our hour and a half. Uh, we are, as you see on this page, we have lots of emails addresses for you all, and we are happy to take follow-up questions as you think of them. Thank you much for all of us at CMQCC for joining us today, and we look forward to working with you in the future.